Okay, so I continue right where I stopped yesterday. Um, there's a slight change in program, so I announced um, that I would today speak about um, uh, Jakob Stilio Glicksberg decomposition. I switched this to tomorrow and today I'm doing the factors and joinings because it uh, fits n nicely with what I did yesterday. So, um, um, this is now uh, section five. Uh, couplings and joinings. So what is the, um, uh, what are couplings and joinings? Um, <clears throat> I recall the notion of a probability subspace of some L1 of X, so you have X as a probability space, L1 of X is the associated L1 space. I, yesterday I defined the notion of a probability subspace here, and um, so you have, for example, you have probability subspaces uh, as subspaces of L1 of X, and um, you have a family of those. Now, the, the whole uh, set of probability subspaces of L1X is a lattice, if you intersect arbitrarily an arbitrarily family of such subspaces, you get again such a subspace. And so you can also talk of the, the least uh, probability subspace containing a certain set, just the intersection of all those spaces that contains the set. So that is the generated probability subspace. And so whenever you have uh, such a family, you find, let's say, the, the smallest probability subspace um, that contains certain family of F alpha, then you denote it by this uh, big V as because it's a supremum in the lattice of all these uh, subspaces. I mean, this is a... Sorry? Yeah, you have one, X is the probability space. X is just all, all information is here in that symbol. X is the probability space, set, sigma algebra, and measure. And now I'm talking just functionalistically about subspaces of L1. And uh, okay, so this is the <clears throat> this is a join, you could say. So this is a, a um, oh, well. yeah. Uh, so okay, it's a supremum in this in the sub lattice. Uh, how can one describe this um, more constructively? Uh, now the problem here is a bit. Um, uh, so, the, if you think of the definition of a probability subspace, you need that it is closed under uh, taking the absolute value. Now, it's not so easy to generate such such a thing uh, as, as a okay. As if you have think of generation from uh, in the, on the linear algebra level, it's easy. You just take linear combinations. But here, you want not just linear combinations. You also want that it's closed under taking the modulus of a function. And so you, you, you would somehow imply a recursive procedure first. So you start with all these, you start to take the vector space generated by this, then you, then, you, uh, then you add all the moduli of these functions, then you again take the linear closure, linear hull, then you again take the modulus. And so it's very uh, kind of a difficult recursive thing to generate this. But there's another way to, uh, to generate it, and that's because um, uh, in L infinities, uh, C star algebras are closed under modulus. If, or, or I say, if you have a, a, a subspace of, of L infinity that's closed, and then then it's a multiplicatively, um, so it's it's an algebra if and only if it's a, a lattice. So uh, so here is an alternative description of this, uh, how to how you generate this. You take um, you take all these spaces F alpha. And uh, you uh, intersect them with L infinity, which is uh, this is dense in F alpha, and it's a, and it's an algebra. Then you um, uh, uh, take the uh, the union, and then you uh, take again the uh, the algebra. No, F alpha not, but F alpha is the L1 space of LX, 
this is an L1 space, and if you intersect with L infinity, you get the corresponding L infinity space. So, um, so you take the algebra, so all um, the linear span of all the finite products that you can generate from this. Yes, and now you uh, take the L1 closure of this. Yes, so this is the closure in L1 of, of this algebra that you that you generate. So all the finite products that you can take from these uh, from these sets, and then the linear span is still an algebra, still conjugation invariant, and then um, you'd, the L infinity closure would be a uh, generating uh, C star algebra for this for this uh, space. And this is, the, this is the description that one uses usually in, when generating such, uh, uh, <clears throat> such joints. Okay, uh, if, there's, if this is a dynamical situation and we have factors instead of just probability subspaces, then this description tells you that if these are T invariant, so these are really factors, then this is also a factor. Because uh, the, the dynamics is multiplicative, so it will uh, respect this, uh, uh, this description. Okay, uh, if these are all strict uh, T factors, so if you don't have non-invertible dynamics and, and these, are, these, are, but these are strict uh, factors, so also, invertible, uh, also invariant under the, the adjoint of the dynamics, then this need not be invariant under the, the, the adjoint. So you have to be careful here. So this is, um, this is only good if, um, let's say, if you have invert really invertible dynamics on each of these, then it will be invertible here too, but, um, but not uh, if you have general non-invertible dynamics. But you do like natural extensions and solve this problem? Uh, uh, well, you can, so, yeah, you, in a sense you can, but, but you will get a different, I mean, if you want the strict, the strict factor that, uh, that are generated, but those will, gen, will usually be larger, and you cannot describe it in this way. You have, I mean, you, 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 have an, you have an effective, maybe, I come to this, like uh, invertible extension, I do this next, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, not, um, uh, it's not immediately clear how this then looks, like as a, as a, as a constructive description of this, uh, uh, generated factor. Okay, um, now this is the situation as in the subspace lattice. Um, uh, in general, of course, we think categorically, we think in arrows. So uh, call this an extension if you have a, um, so if you have a, an embedding, a Markov embedding like this, um, I call this an ex extension. So this is a factor, this is the extension. This is a factor of this, this is the extension of this. Um, by, uh, by such a Markov embedding, so J is Markov embedding, of course. And um, uh, now think of you have a lot of them. Then, uh, then this is a common extension. Yes, they, go, they all go into the same space. And then uh, somehow, then the, the images of these uh, these spaces in here, uh, you can join them. So you can ask whether these images, if you join them, is the whole L of Z. And then this is called a coupling. So uh, if uh, L1 of Z is the whole, uh, then uh, this common extension is called a coupling. So coupling is coupling is the word you use if there's no dynamics involved. So it's uh, uh, it does let's say trivial dynamics, so to speak. If there if you have dynamics unspecified, then you usually speak of a joining. So then then a coupling becomes a joining if all these. Uh, um, embeddings here are intertwining, so this is really a factor of the of the system, and then um, then you call the, the coupling a joining. And uh, I always said uh, once said to to Marius that I, so a coupling so a, so a coupling is a special special kind of joining, namely with the trivial dynamics. But somehow he didn't like this idea. So somehow he, uh, one it, it seems that one has to say coupling uh, if you. 
Uh, don't have to consider dynamics, and joining implies always that you have dynamics, dynamic situation. But, but for me, okay, okay, it's I would say coupling is just a special way of joining where the dynamics is trivial. Okay, anyway, so this is coupling, and if if, uh, uh, if t da, so if the dynamic in dynamic situation. Then it's called joining. Okay, here's a here's a little notation, notational convention. Suppose uh, suppose you have an um, you take a, an L affinity function from x alpha for each alpha uh, and all all but finitely many. Uh, R1, then I I'm, take this uh, tensor product notation for uh, for this uh, product. So you see, F alpha is in, in in L infinity X alpha. J alpha takes it into L infinity of Z. And this is just a finite product, effectively. So you just you just multiply all these functions and uh, uh, denote it by this symbol. I, I uh, add the z here to make sure that this is not uh, an algebraic tensor product, uh, but uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is, so this is related to this uh, probability space z. So we come to algebraic tensor products later. Um, so the, um, these functions here are actually generating uh, the join of the ranges. So this space is generated by, by these, uh, these products, as I just explained there. Uh, so this whole thing is a coupling if uh, the, well, the algebra generated by, by these functions is dense in, in L1z. OK, so uh, this, this was the, the, the general introduction of couplings and joinings. Now we have different questions, of course. Are there couplings? Can one always find them? Uh, and, and so on. So here is a, here's, here's a trivial example. Uh, you can always find a, a joining. Namely, you can just, let's say, you have two, L, two L1 spaces over probability spaces. Uh, trivial joining is just taking the product measure. That's the, uh, the simplest way to join, so that's an independent joining because the two uh, spaces will be the, the the functions from L1 of x and L1 of y. They will be within L1 of z. They will be just independent random variables, so to speak. Um, that's one way, but of course that's not, that's uh, sometimes the uninteresting way. So the more interesting way is uh, how you can join systems uh, into one and maybe not completely independent, but somehow differently. And uh, I will explain several methods of uh, doing this, of several views on, on what, uh, what these joinings are. Uh, and I stick to my operator theoretic approach here, although it's not very far from uh, what you can read in, let's say, uh, Glasner's book or so. Um, <clears throat> so um, because uh, Karma already asked that, so I will make an example um, um, about, I will say something about inductive limits and, um, and the invertible extension. So that, um, uh, this, is, this is a point where I really like this approach because somehow an inductive limit from a functional analytic point is easy. Somehow, um, it's just uh, an increasing, an increasing chain of uh, well, chain not not in all all cases chains, but let's say in the, in the simplest case, a chain increasing chain of sub of spaces, and then uh, you somehow uh, take the union and then close it with respect to a norm. Um, so suppose you have a a sequence. Well, I do inductive limits only for sequences. You can do this for in a more general. Uh, a uh, more general uh, setup, but uh, let's say sequences are okay for us in the moment. So, so this is uh, one, two, three. So, 
So you have a sequence of, of embeddings. So this is an extension. So um, this, is, this sits via J1 as a subspace into a, in, in one X2. This sits as a subspace here via this identification and so on. And, um, and now uh, um, there is a, functionalytically there's an easy way to pro provide here kind of a, a, a huge subspace, a huge space. Uh, which is called, well, algebraically, it's the inductive limit of this, uh, this chain. I don't know whether you are so familiar with this, but more or less what you do is uh, you d take the disjoint union of these, uh, of these spaces and you define an equivalence relation in such a way that, uh, that, uh, that uh, something in here is equivalent to something in, in here if, uh, if this is by uh, taking it over uh, via these mappings onto that element. So that is, the, uh, that is an equivalence relation. And then on, that, uh, on, that, uh, on the space of classes of equivalent uh, uh, elements, you can define in a unique way a vector space structure. You make it a vector space in such a way that, that somehow the, the, the embeddings taking a, a, an element here onto its equivalence class is linear. And since all these uh, mappings here are isometric, you have a unique norm that makes these uh, canonical embeddings isometric. So then you close it, and then you get a, a huge Banach space, and you get somehow uh, a space here, call it E, in that where all these spaces embed, and it it's, uh, uh, commutes with these uh, individual embeddings. Yeah, so you can embed, these are all sitting inside in here in a way that uh, the two elements are sitting on the same element in here if, if they are connected by such a, such a mapping. Now, uh, here is the functionalistic way of, of, of viewing this. All these spaces here are somehow abstract L space. They are L1 spaces. The, they, are, they have a, a Banach lattice structure. You can induce the Banach lattice structure here. The norms are additive on the positive cone. So it will also here be a norm that is additive on the positive cone. And then there is an abstract theorem by Kakutani that says this is an L1 space. But, um, but here's even easier. But what you can do is uh, take the L infinity spaces here. And then this restricts to, let's say, C star algebra embeddings from the L infinity spaces. Then, of course, this carries, so their inductive limit carries a unique C star algebra structure commutative with unital. And so, you know, by Gelfand's theorem, there is a, a representing compact space. And so this uh, uh, has a, um, let's say, um, has also the structure of an L1 space. So you can, you can find a representing uh, prob underlying probability space here. Um, so this is, the, this is an inductive limit, and if all these are factors, so if you have dynamic situation, then of course you can induce uh, the dynamics here, the, these, uh, um, the, the Markov embedding, which is the dynamics, the T, you can, they are all commuting here, intertwining, so you, you would first induce it on the, on, the, um, on, the, on the union of these spaces, and then uh, by continuity on the closure, so you get it here. So this is... No, uh, no, 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 not at all. I mean, you cannot. You can even think of uh, general inductive systems. So, so you have a so you have a net of, of L1 spaces, and you have uh, for each pair um, uh, of alphas and betas, there is there is some gamma which is uh, uh, in the order higher, and and you have connecting uh, you have connecting embeddings. Um, just with a, uh, in a compatible, compatible way, then you get in such an inductive system, then you can define such things. It has nothing to do with countability, separability, nothing. It's just a general. I was thinking because of defining product measures, for instance, if you, if you are not sigma additive or something like that. Yeah, no, but. The, defining so many, so many products. Yeah, but this is the, the, the coolest thing here is uh, function analysis solves the problem, so to speak, because so uh, you see. Uh, well, you can do this with L1 spaces uh, for, of general measure spaces. You can, then you get an L1 space of a general measure space. That's uh, clear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You can do this. Yeah. But uh, then you get some L space, which then you can represent again. Yeah. 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 
Well, you see, uh, you, uh, you don't see the measures here anymore. You only see integrals. You only see um, just functions. And so, so it's not uh, really. Um, OK. <clears throat> so now uh, let's apply this to, a, to the situation you have a dynamic. So you suppose you have, a, you have one space, x, and you have uh, the, the dynamics on, on that space. Then, uh, then you can uh, set up the following chain of uh, uh, yes, you get an inductive system. Just this is a, this is a Markov embedding, so you can instead of T, you rename it and, and, and name it J1 and J2. But but this is a, this is just the situation. So it has an inductive limit here, and. Um, if you think of this inductive limit a bit more, then you will find that if this, so if, if, if this is non-invertible on, on, on L1, uh, it's, uh, it's the, the dynamics is invertible on, on that space, on this inductive limit. It's very easy because, uh, um, uh, because you only need that, that the, the dynamics is subjective on the dense subspace because it's an isometry, and the dense subspace will be the union of these spaces here. But uh, um, so whenever, whenever I have a proof here, let me see. Um, um, so you suppose you have an element, you have an element which is um, um, you have an element here, which comes from some element in one of these spaces, let's say one, one in here. Yes? Then, uh, uh, then this space is, th this element here is the same as its T image in this space, in that space. Yes? Because these were the identification maps. So this element is identified with its T image in here. Yes? So the element as, as, as regarded in this space is the same as the T image of, of an element from, uh, uh, from, a, from such a space. So it is a T image. So it is subject, T is subjective in here. So it's a bit, uh, uh, it's a bit counterintuitive, but um, um, when you think of it closer, it becomes, uh, it becomes really a one-liner. It's just a, just a matter of notation somehow, that you keep uh, the notation right. Yes, so, uh, so T is invertible here. Even if, uh, if T is not invertible here, T is invertible here. And um, somehow this these inductive, uh, in, in inductive limit has, of course, a, a, a universal property. So it's kind of the, the smallest uh, in, uh, inductive, uh, the, the smallest uh, L1 space that somehow satisfies a certain uh, uh, condition and so this this whole this whole uh, construction is functorial. That means if you have a suppose you have a different chain here and you get somehow Markov maps that connect and that they intertwine, then you induce there's a unique Markov uh, map that that goes from this into the uh, inductive limit here. So it's a functorial way of con doing this. <clears throat> Yes, so this invertible extension somehow has also a certain minimality properties, the minimal one where this, where you can embed L1 as a, uh, and it's invertible. So in, in particular, if T is invertible here, this, this invertible extension is just L1x again. So it's not, there's no, uh, uh, so this, this embedding of, this embedding from that in here is just an isomorphism in that case. Okay, so this is invertible extension in my view. Okay, let's uh, let me see. Wow, time flies. Okay, um, so what has this all to do with operators? This is the operators as joining. So uh, operators can define joinings. <laughs> And uh, I will explain this, how, how this is done. And this solves then a pro the problem of constructing joinings. So um, uh, consider, 
consider a certain coupling. Now we are just uh, considering two spaces. So you have a certain coupling. Let's say you have a, a one of x here, you have a one of y here, and you have these embeddings. Call that jx and jy for the time being. So, um, so now this is a, a certain coupling. Let's say uh, this is minimal here in the sense that, okay, this is really the coupling. So these two, the images here generate the space. Um, now what you can do is um, you can form an operator. And now I have to be careful because uh, it will not commute in that way. So the, the, uh, the point is that you can embed an element here into the, and then you go down with the uh, adjoint of this map. You can go down here again. So um, go down here. So this adjoint is nothing else than the conditional the conditional expectation operator. If you if you identify this space with its subspace in with the image under J Y in here, then this. Uh, a joint is nothing else than this conditional expectation operator. So, and, and here, of course, you can go like this. And just, so you, there is an operator S that uh, goes from here to here that makes this diagram commutative. As yes, you embed, and then you project down uh, onto, the, onto the different factors, so other factors. So that is, uh, uh, and this operator here now is a Markov operator because this is a one and this is a Markov operator, and concatenation of Markov operators is Markov. So. You have a, a Markov operator defined by this, by this joining. So what I want to show you is that actually the joinings, the, so the different well, couplings, the different ways of putting these two spaces into one, uh, one space in this minimal way so that it's a, a coupling, uh, is uh, in one-to-one -one correspondence with Markov operators from here to here. So yeah, for each Markov operator, there's a unique way of, of, of couple these two spaces. I showed you that every coupling defines such a, such a Markov operator. Now th this is the other way around. And in order to do this, I need another description uh, of, um, uh, of these, uh, these couplings. And this is, uh, uh, this is by way of uh, taking uh, models and looking at the product. So uh, for, suppose that X and Y are compact. So I mean compact probability spaces, compact Austov spaces, and, the, and their measures are, are uh, uh, regular Borel probability measures. Yes, and then, um, <clears throat> then of course, then I define Z to be their, uh, their, their Cartesian product. Of course, it's again compact. And I say that for compact spaces, I have an identification via the Ries representation theorem of, uh, let's say, functionals on C of X of the, of the continuous functions and the regular probability measures. So uh, this, this is always tested in everything. What I say is uh, um, uh, kind of this identification I always assume as known. Um, so, so mu as a, let's say, it's a probability measure on on Z is a coupling measure. That's probably that's maybe the definition all of you already know. A coupling measure. So if uh, if the marginals that's projected down to these two factors uh, results in the measures that are given on on X and Y. So if you project uh, onto onto X. Um, um, of mu is uh, mu x, and if project onto y, of mu is uh, mu y. Okay, so that that just means now if you endow z with this measure and you take the L1 spaces, then these embeddings, the canonical embeddings uh, on the level of continuous functions, become Markov embeddings on the level of uh, L1 spaces. So that's the coupling measures. And, uh, and these couplings are in one-to-one -one correspondence with such coupling measures if you fix the models. So if you, if you fix the models for x for this basis and this space, then you, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, so, okay, uh, here's the theorem. Uh, 
That's interesting. We are already in section seven. This is six. This is maybe seven. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> narration is a bit. So, uh, so in the situation I described, so you have X and Y compact probability spaces. Uh, then, you, then you have the following assertions. Um, okay, first of all, if you have such a coupling measure, then, uh, then you can uh, define this operator, which is then uh, depending on the measure. So uh, uh, call it S, S mu. So the mapping mu maps to S mu. Uh, so this goes from the coupling measures, coupling measures, to uh, the Markov operators of one prob probability space x to the, so L1 of x to L1 of y. Um, this is bijective, this, this is a bijection. Uh, to say the least, I mean, it's affine also. Uh, of course, coupling measures is an affine set, so uh, um, is, an, is, a, is a convex set, so this is, this is also convex, so this is an affine bijection, and it also has continuity properties with respect to, let's say, here weak star topology, and here the, the weak operator topology. So the bijection comes from this representation here? I will show you how the bijection is done. I will show you, just be a bit patient. <laughs> just in a second, I will do. And um, the second one is, um, uh, it's a complete classification, so if you have any other joining, uh, coupling, so if, if, if Z zero, and then the, let's say you have, uh, is, any, is any coupling of uh, X and Y, then, uh, uh, then there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a unique, there's a unique coupling measure there's a unique coupling measure mu uh, with a property that uh, such that there is a uh, a Markov embedding uh, a Markov embedding uh, that that uh, makes the following diagrams commutative so here uh, okay you embed l1 of x here and you embed in 1 of x here, so here that was j of x, so here you get j x zero. So this should commute, and, uh, and the same for, uh, for y. So if you embed y here and phi, then this is the embedding here. So a plus say and, and for y. Same for y. So this is the, this is the, um, the best that you can hope for. Uh, if you, uh, a coupling is uh, uh, any such, uh, uh, such probability space and embedding such that the ranges generate a one. And, um, and, of, and this, this tells you, you have a complete classification of couplings up to a natural way of equivalence, uh, uh, a natural notion of equivalence with these joining measures on, on the product space. I think the coupling meshes on the product space. Okay, actually, I want to show you the proof of this um, because it's nice functional analysis behind here. So, so here's a here's the lemma. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will repeat the question, so just tell it and I will say it again. No? I, mean, I, I would like to understand a bit better this, the meaning of this operator S uh, in the case of coupling. Is something like conditional expectation? Yeah, yeah, it's like. You, 
it is. Uh, How can I think of it to get back in probabilistic terms? Uh, so Sorry, it's a, it is a, it is a, it is n nothing else than conditional expectation. It's conditional expectation when you first identify uh, um, the, the element of L1x as an element of L1z. So you have this, you have this uh, diagram. No, it's not a disintegration. It's just really just conditional expectation, but just keeping in mind where the. The, the, the spaces. So, uh, so here, this is the conditional expectation operator so when you identify this with the subspace here. And, and, and to say, to first embed it and then project it is just taking, restricting the conditional expectation operator on that space when we view this as a subspace in here. Yeah, you, 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 you think of everything is, suppose these are real inclusions. So this is, a, this is just included, and this is the conditional expectation onto the factor. So, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, okay. I don't know what the, I don't know what it, what it, I don't know what you mean give, what do you mean by given the second it's for me a condition yeah, expectation yeah, it's just this yeah yeah okay then it's I, okay okay if the answer is yes then it's yes very good <laughs> so uh, there's a there's a nice lemma behind that uh, suppose x, y, and omega are compact spaces, compact Hausdorff spaces, just topological uh, situation now. Uh, suppose s and t are operators, uh, so s is, s is an operator from c of x into c of omega, and t is an operator from c of y into c of omega. Uh, of course, bounded operators, uh, linear. <laughs> And uh, so then there is a unique uh, bounded operator, Q, which uh, depends, of course, on S and T, with a, from C of the product to C of omega, satisfying that if you take the function F times G, where F is depending on X and G is depending on Y, so this is the function um, sending X comma Y to F of X times G of Y. Um, that's Tf or Sf times Tg. So, um, so F here as a notation, this is just F of x times G of y to make sure that this is clear. And, um, and if you think of this, it's not so clear why this should be should should work because, of course, uh, uh, these functions here, the linear span of these functions, is dense in here by the stone weierstrass theorem. Um, but uh, it's not clear that you can somehow define this in a unique way. I mean, um, uh, if you want to extend this linearly, this is not a basis or so. You you would have to you have uh, different ways of writing. Uh, a function as a linear combination of such fu of such com uh, f tensor g's, and then you would have to show that this is uh, independent of um, of the representation, and then it has continuity properties, and then you can extend. Uh, unfortunately, there is a, a very nice way to view this. Uh, um, so maybe I'll write here. Um, so here's the proof. The proof of this uh, is like this. Just trace the chain of the following uh, 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 arrows. Trace the arrows in this diagram. So what is C of x t uh, times y? C of x times y can be viewed as uh, C of uh, x with values and C of y with a canonical norm. So this identification uh, is uh, it's easy, so it uses uh, uh, uniform continuity on compacts. Uh, then, of course, here now, take a function f with value, uh, taking points of x into functions. Here you can ju just concatenate with the operator t. So this uh, goes f, well, 
maybe I should write it like f to t after f. Then you get an operator, then you get a function from uh, x into c of omega. Now, here you can exchange, this is the same, uh, so this is uh, the same. So here again, you, uh, you, now you turn around. Now you do the same with s. So you get something, so this is g mapping to s after g. And here you get omega, c of omega, then this again is this. So, uh, so if you buy that, if you buy that the product, that the continuous functions on the product is nothing else than the continuous functions with values in the continuous functions, then this is just applied this twice, namely first uh, c of x. This is c of x times omega, and this is also c of x times omega. Yeah. So and now the last, the last step. That's the di that's the Koopman operator of the diagonal embedding. So d. Um, uh, df of uh, omega is just f of omega omega. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so you have here, you have the same factors here, omega and omega. And so you can, this is the diagonal embedding of, uh, of omega into, into, the, into the product with itself, just on the diagonal. And there the Koopman operator associated with it. So this operator is the uh, Q. <laughs> And uh, if you, if, if you, so this is, a, this is clearly a bounded operator defined now. You only have to check that this is true here on that, on these kinds of elements. So if you think of having such an element here, then okay, uh, this is an element, this is the same element here, viewed as a function with, on the first variable with values and functions on the second one. Now, uh, this is just concatenating with t. That means you apply t on, that, on, on g here. So here you are with f tensor t g. Now, this turns around things. So this you are here in t g tensor f. Then you are here with t g tensor s f. Um, now you turn around again or whatever, and then, and then the diagonal embedding just uh, maps this to the product of these two functions. So you are here with uh, T, uh, T, G, S, F. So that's, uh, that's, that's how you do it. Okay, now uh, if you have this lemma, then uh, uh, Let's see what we can do about the theorem. Let me think, see on the. Ah. Um, so here, here's how you prove of the so sketch. Sketch of the proof. Um, so, so we already had uh, how we associate the operator s to, to to a given measure mu. Now we do it the other way around. Um, suppose you're given a Markov operator from that space into this space. Um, um, so regard this as an operator on C of X, so embed C of X into L1 of X, and uh, this maps uh, C of x into L infinity of y. Yes, because these are bounded functions and Markov operator take bounded functions to bounded functions. So you interpret this operator actually as an operator of C of x into L infinity of y. Now, uh, L infinity of y is a commutative C star algebra. We had this yesterday, so we can write this as a C of omega space. And omega is the stone space of, uh, of y. So now we are in business because we have, uh, we have this operator that, that maps C of x into a C of omega. So we are in the situation of the lemma. Um, 
So for, for t, you take, this, you take the other way, so t, uh, my operator t is just canonical, so c of y into L infinity of y, the same uh, identification here. Uh, this is just uh, the, canonical, the canonical embedding. So I apply this lemma to these two operators. So what do I get? Sorry. So what do I get? I get, I get an operator Q that maps C of X times Y into uh, uh, into C of omega. But this is again the same as L infinity of Y. So I'm getting an operator Q, Q that maps C of X times Y into L infinity of Y. And if you, if you keep track of the identifications, what you're doing is really uh, F tensor G uh, is mapped onto S F times G. So, um, T is the identity, just uh, on, that, on that coordinate you, uh, you only, you don't do anything, you don't have an operator. Yes? So, but, but this, is now, this is now a bounded operator, uh, actually, um, uh, if you trace this, you see that if both operators here, S and, S and T, are positive, then this will be a positive operator, because all these, all these uh, steps here will map positive functions to positive functions. Also, if, if, F, uh, so if F and G are both the one constant one functions and T and S are one preserving, then of course uh, you get one here. So this operator here, now you here you have the, uh, the uh, integration functional on that space. So you concatenate, then you get a measure here. Uh, so the measure mu is def has, has this property So uh, on x, on z, yes? And it is, of course, uniquely determined by this. Um, now you just check that with this measure, this is the required coupling. So uh, uh, if someone is experienced in functional analysis behind this, this is uh, very close to Grothendieck's theory of integral linear maps. So it's a, it's a, a thing that is, was studied in the 50s by or 50s by 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 Grothendieck, and that he had uh, so the, of course there is a there's much more to say about this, but I, I think this is the core. So this lemma here, this kind of tensor product uh, uh, interpretation, uh, I didn't say about tensor products, but actually there's a tensor product uh, identification here. This is the epsilon tensor product of these two spaces, cx and cy, and. And uh, okay, Grothendieck study tensor products of, uh, of Banach spaces. So, uh, with this in mind, so I'm taking now the, uh, this for granted. So, I, I'm taking this as proven. Um, let us see uh, some, let us pass to the dynamical situation. So, this is just about couplings here. And now the question is, of course, how about joinings? Um, uh, so, we know that uh, uh, so we get there's this correspondence now we ask suppose you have a dynamic situation uh, take the joining measures not just the coupling measures uh, and uh, how can we recognize them uh, through the operator yes um, uh, so uh, uh, so suppose dynamics And now we, well, we want to identify the, the, the joining measures inside the coupling measures. Uh, so this operator here uh, can be written as, as this formally. Uh, look, at, look at this. So um, um, again, make the diagram because uh, to recall, the situation. Now what you do is here, 
uh, first apply the dynamics, then go here, so take conditional expectation on the second factor, and then apply the adjoint of the dynamics here. If, if t is invertible, then this is just the inverse of the, of the, of the dynamics. So um, uh, what, what do we get? So it's like this. Now, this is just computation. And JOX commutes with the dynamics because it's intertwining. Ah, yeah, and they, they also commute with the dynamics. So um, these are also commuting. Now, putting this again in this form, we have this, and this is the identity because T is a Markov embedding, so you get your operator S back. So you have a condition on your operator. The con what is, this is what I call uh, a weakly intertwining some, somehow. Uh, so it's weakly intertwining. I mean, if, S, if, if T intertwines with S or commutes with S, then of course uh, this is true, but there may be cases where S is, uh, weakly T is, uh, S is weakly intertwining but not intertwining. So this is the condition, and you can check that this is actually necessary and sufficient for that the corresponding coupling measure is a joining measure. So this is the, this is the uh, operator theoretic condition to characterize the coupling measures in the, in the joinings. No, the joining measures in the, in the coupling, sorry. So, uh, okay. So we now have a, a, a complete picture on how we con can construct joinings uh, by, way, by way of uh, choosing models and uh, uh, with operators. Uh, unfortunately, if you have more than two factors, then the, uh, no, there is not so an easy operator theoretic characterization anymore. Uh, you would have to pass to multilinear maps. But uh, uh, so for, uh, but you can still uh, characterize them as measures on the product space. And here is the good thing: a product of compact space is always compact, whatever, uh, whether countable or not. So you uh, you can always take uh, arbitrary topological products, and uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, this is the, the good thing in, in compact. And so if you have general measure spaces, then you get in trouble with sigma algebras and so on. Okay, so here so <coughs> this was the joining part. Now, um, in the last, well, I don't have so much time anymore. Uh, actually, okay, let me, uh, I wanted to say something about the relatively independent joining that I skip now because I, uh, another thing I want to do uh, in the last uh, couple of minutes is um, um, to show you the Markov dilation. The Markov dilation, you could, is also used in, uh, as, an, as an, an infinite joining, but uh, it is much more. And uh, it's, it's such a beautiful construction uh, that I uh, cannot refrain from showing you. So suppose, so here's the, here's the setup. Suppose you have a, a chain of, um, of um, Markov operators. So the, the S, the SJ are Markov, not uh, embeddings. And uh, ah, yeah, uh, just, a, just a word here. Uh, this whole thing looks as if it has a, uh, it is a somehow uh, important, uh, uh, how you say, it has a chirality, so it seems that there's a left side and a right side. But everything is symmetric because, because when you take the other, 
the other direction is just adjoints. And so you, you have the adjoint operator. So there is, there's a complete symmetry here. So the, the, the unsymmetry that is, uh, this is just apparent. There's no fundamental asymmetry here. So um, um, you can, so, so when, when, if I write it like this, it's just for convenience now. We could also write it in the other way, but then you would have to take adjoints at certain, at certain points. So that's, uh, uh, because just Markov operators, we, uh, uh, if we had Markov embeddings, of course, that's a different thing because then we, then we uh, want more. Okay, now take this and now, uh, now apply this procedure here repeatedly. So you, uh, you get here, let's say, the first joining of these two via this operator, coupling, let's say. Just a coupling via this operator. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, maybe I should write another one here. Uh, you have this operator, so coming from here and embed in here, yes? Then you, we, via this operator, you can couple these two. So you get another one here. Yes, and now you continue in this manner. Now, this is a chain of embeddings. Take the inductive limit here. Yes? So now we, we, look, we look at this space and we look what we can say about these, these operators by looking at this construction. So, uh, <clears throat> first of all, what is, uh, uh, what is the, the conditional expectation from here to here. So first of all, uh, uh, we only work on a dense set of elements. We only work on functions that can be written in this way. Oh, this is x0, so I'm putting 0 here. So we, we, look, at, we look at functions of this form. Uh, so function from here, function from here, and so on, always embedded and then multiplied. This, this forms a, a, so the linear span of this is dense in this space. So uh, everything is de determined on, on, by when we know it on these elements. Now what is the, uh, uh, the conditional expectation onto the first factor? So onto this. So here is the, the formula. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, the formula is like this. So you start with Fn. You, uh, you operate on it with Sn, then you, are, then you are one step further left. Then you multiply this with Fn minus 1, then you operate again with Sn minus 1, and here uh, uh, you have S1, and then you, here you have, there's a lot of brackets here, of course, like this. <laughs> so this is how, how it works. This is how it works. So that's the conditional expectation on the, on the first uh, on the first factor. Okay, now, uh, so th this construction appeared in two different contexts. Actually, okay, first, uh, in an abstract way, it, it appeared in, Ro in a paper of Rota from 1961. And, um, and then later, so uh, uh, this is nothing else than uh, an abstract version of Kolmogorov's construction of a Markov process from, from uh, individual, uh, uh, how do you say this? Uh, yeah, these, these Overgangsmatrices, how do you say this? Uh, in, in, in Dutch it's Overgangsmatrizen, how do you say this? Yeah, the, yeah. okay, the conditional probabilities, yeah. And, uh, and uh, uh, so, in fact, so if you, uh, so I don't, uh, so Rota has, is also an interesting uh, application here, it's, it's of a different manner, but if you make a mark, the Markov dilation case is, uh, is then just, you take all the spaces the same, and you take, um, um, and now you consider an operator T, define T on uh, L1 of Z, infinity, well, z infinity, uh, uh, such that, so t of, uh, 
such an element is just shifting it one further. So this corresponds on the level of continuous function, let's say, it corresponds just, uh, it's just the Koopman operator of the left shift. So you transport the functions one further right. But if you, if you look at this, um, this formula, and then uh, let's say plug in this one and integrate, then you find that this operator is integral preserving. So it, uh, uh, because all these are, uh, so these are all uh, Markov operators. Ah, uh, maybe one should uh, have these are all the same also. Maybe. Uh, is measure preserving if, if they are all the same? Yeah. Of course, otherwise it's not. So then it's, uh, then, it's, then it's a measure preserving transformation. So, and what you get is, actually you get the following. The, um, so here is uh, that space, here you get your original one. Um, here you, uh, you take the power of your operator, and here you actually get the power of this operator. <laughs> um, and here you get conditional expectation again. So this is embed, this is conditional expectation. And this commutes for every n. This is what is called a Markov dilation. And this operator, so what you do is you start with a Markov operator and you get, you get an embedding into a bigger space where this Markov operator turns out to be a Koopman operator. So uh, that can reduce uh, questions of um, Markov operators to actually Koopman operators. So this is a, an, uh, this is a lattice homomorphism uh, where this is not. So, um, <clears throat> okay, um, let's see. It's, I think it's uh, oh, hard, high time to stop. Um, thank you very much for your attention.